Hey, what's up, y'all? Uh, thanks for being so patient. Thanks, everybody. This is such an amazing event. I'm sorry that I haven't gone to Hack LU before, you know, and Luxembourg is pretty dope. So I'm going to remember that when I go back home and make sure I tell more folks where I'm from, which is uh, New York, to come here uh, and check out this event. It's uh, rare because uh, I work with an event called IFF, and I always tell people um, IFF is an event where everyone is so smart that the participants could be speakers. But here I think it's literally true. So it's like everyone almost is a speaker and everyone's got so much to share. I learned so much from everyone. Okay, let's go. Uh, my talk is uh, organize, uh, encrypt, organize, and resist digital safety for politically vulnerable organizations and civil society. And um, I, let, I'll start. Let's go. Okay. Uh, I'm going to make the slides available. I'm just going to tweet them out. But it's a pretty chill Creative Commons license. So you can go nuts with that. Okay. Uh, who are you listening to? Uh, I'm a hacker and a security researcher. I'm the director of digital safety at a group called uh, Tactical Tech. I'll talk about that later. Uh, I'm an operational security trainer with a group called GJS. I'll talk about that later. And I'm an advisor to a bunch of folks. And I used to have a mad fellowships. Um, but I'll talk to you. You know, you could you could peep the slides. Uh, I used to be a, a data journalist at the New York Times um, many many careers ago. And now I just do this full time. Okay, so. Uh, this is like my whole thing is about being super positive. And uh, I remember this like Yoko Ono, John Lennon uh, ad campaign called War is Over If You Want It. So like tomorrow, if nobody wanted to touch a gun, there'd be no gun violence. It's like that simple. Like we actually have control over it. And that seems a hard thing to imagine. But if you can get one person to agree and then two, maybe we can get a whole world where that is actually the next day. And uh, if I didn't think like this, I wouldn't be able to do my work. Okay, cool, cool. So uh, I have a shirt. It says, don't be a rapist. Uh, I take my shirt off, right? It's a pretty simple request, uh, and it works the same way. Uh, don't be a rapist, right? Um, just like, don't do it. It's just like, war is over if you want it. As men, we actually control this crime. It's like a part of crime, like murder and theft that we have 100% control over. And if we all just were decided not to be rapists, there would be no more rapists. Uh, so, like, let's do it. All right? Okay. Um, this shirt was made not by me. This shirt was made by a group called Equality Labs. Uh, Equality Labs is one of those politically vulnerable organizations who I'm honored and lucky enough to know. And um, they work against a caste system in India because they are uh, in the caste system, what's called the Dalits. Uh, some people might call them untouchable. Right? And uh, it completely affects your entire life because of your last name. And it, again, only exists in the minds of the people who live in a space. And if everyone wanted to change it, much like apartheid in South Africa, we could, like tomorrow, if we just said we would do not agree with this. And um, they don't just work in their country. They work internationally. And uh, this is them with their We Believe Survivors post from October 3rd when they were in Washington, D.C., protesting against uh, Kavanaugh, who was a um, candidate for the Supreme Court, who now will be uh, for life in this position in the United States as a Supreme Court justice, steering that government. And uh, they're amazing people. But if you read here, they're a South Asian community um, uh, technology organization dedicated to ending caste, apartheid, Islamophobia, and religious intolerance. And they're amazing people, so definitely find out more about them. Okay. So how did I get into this? Uh, when I was a kid... I was like a young punk rock kid, you know, and I was like a straight edge vegan and all my friends were eating, uh, you know, plants and trying to help homeless people by feeding them vegetable sandwiches that they didn't want. <laughs> what were we thinking? So, um, but uh, there were a bunch of kids who were just like me. I should not take this off because my headset's on it. Sorry. And um, they were from uh, Long Island, New York, and they had this thing called Stop Hutchington Animal Cruelty. It wasn't like PETA or anything like that. They had a very specific request. Stop this one organization that was doing vivisection, which is like operating on monkeys and doing all kinds of crazy stuff. And uh, they became known as the Shack 7 because, uh, strangely enough, uh, there were some charges put on them because they ran a website that anyone could post to. It was almost like a Reddit or Twitter, but mad long time ago. And in the United States, uh, a, a particular law was designed just to catch them. And they were like, there's this one post on your website, and you're responsible for this post. It's something that would never happen today. But um, we all thought, hey, they're going to give them a pat on the wrist. They're just a bunch of white suburban kids who like to eat tofu. Um, what's going on over there? I want to do that. What's on that screen? I want to see what's on that screen. Nope? Okay. Wake those guys up. Um, 
You can sit in the back and do your work. I love doing my work. I'm in the back of your presentations doing my work, but I don't sit up front and do work and talk. You can't, you could talk or you could do work. Can't do both. All right. I'm calling you out, yo. Excuse me. Thank you. Okay. So, uh, my friend Andy over here, he got three years in prison. And each down the line, you'll see four and a half years, five years, three years, four years, one year in prison. Each of these totally young, totally idealistic suburban kids. And it wasn't a normal prison. They put him in something called a CMU, Communication Management Unit, where you, we moved far away from us, where we couldn't get him books, we couldn't get him letters. There was this idea at the time, because it was around the time of 9-11, and you know, we're all going after Osama bin Laden in the United States, uh, that the CMUs were completely civil rights uh, and racist thing because it was only Muslim prisoners. So to fight that, they did this thing called balancing, where they started putting these kids in those places to say, look, that guy's not Muslim, she's not Muslim, all right? And uh, it's when I learned this very simple fact. If you do anything positive in this world and you're fighting to change the status quo, that's awesome. You do that because you believe that's where right, okay? But there are people in a position of power, in the seats of money, and they do not want those things changed. When we have one of those small wins, they have a small loss. And when we have one of those crazy headline-grabbing days where we have a huge win, they have an insanely huge loss. And they're not used to losing. You know, when you become a thorn in their side, they remember you because they made these rules. And this isn't a game where they can lose. So that day needs to never happen again. And that's when I committed my work as a hacker to helping these kids and folks like them. So that doesn't happen again. So sorry if I take it personal. It's not about you. Okay, so um, I worked for a group called GGS Security in the past. And uh, they're a risk mitigation organization. So a lot of these like risk mitigation threat intelligence organizations exist, but they're like an actually pretty progressive one. And they mo wor most, wor um, most of the time worked with reporters. And they did hostile environment emergency first aid. So when you get this HEFAT training, that's what that stands for, uh, it's about because you're going to a hurricane or because you're going to a war zone, you, because you're going into a riot, you need to know what to do to stay alive, to do your good job and get home safe. You need to know how to keep people to your left and right alive if they fall, because no one else is going to do it. Because that press helmet and that press bag and all those badges don't do anything anymore. It doesn't work anymore, right? And I know personally many journalists who are not alive right now, and uh, this kind of work keeps them alive. So what GGS started doing was moving from just physical security stuff to emotional, psychological stuff, and that was revolutionary at the time. And then they added a digital component, and that's one of the things that I started helping them with when I joined their group, which is creating a hostile environment for your technology. So instead of saying, hey, reporter, you should use Signal, it's like, hey, reporter, this is not a do-no-harm environment. You signed off on this. Like, your phone is being attacked. This is what it looks like. This is what it looks like when this is a laptop that's fine. This laptop is crawling with malware. It's a different thing when you can see it. It's a different thing when you know why you're putting a sticker on your uh, camera because you see another screen of that camera, right? And that's what GGS was uh, doing for folks, which I really appreciate it. Um, currently, I'm the director of digital safety and privacy for Tactical Technology Collective. They're an NGO that works internationally, but uh, centered out of Ber uh, Berlin, Germany. And um, yeah, it's an honor to be there. I've been there since February, and I'm doing amazing work with people who I look up to and idolize every day. Please look into the work they do, which includes um, not teaching people how to encrypt their emails or you know send messages under um, you know suspicious uh, authoritarian eyes, but really just rethinking how we work and what our digital rights are, and most importantly, explain to people that everything we use in technology has another side to it. We're all curious people, and we tend to see those sides, but a lot of our friends and family and people in this world don't realize that there could be a negative use for Facebook, right? I was reading this article just yesterday about how Facebook was weaponized by the Myanmar government and used for genocide, right? And it was so ingenious, you've got to read the, how this was done. It's not just uh, changing the way you think to possibly sway an election. It's bodies uh, who aren't here anymore because of a post. Okay, so what is civil society? In my talk, I talk about civil society. Civil society is the world of uh, grant makers who support people who are making major change happen all around this world. Uh, civil society are nonprofits. And civil societies, non-governmental organizations, and it's that ecosystem. And it's not something that maybe a lot of people in this room work in, but we need more people like you all. 
right? So uh, definitely, if you're interested, even if you have like just five seconds of uh, time or one day uh, or weekend every other month, you can make amazing things happen because uh, civil society is being attacked all day, every day in this current environment. Uh, what is a politically vulnerable organization? Um, so this is uh, Sean Brooks, right? And um, he works for uh, Berkeley, uh, it's a school in California, and they have a group there called the Center for Long-Term Cybersecurity. And uh, I'm, I count him as a friend, and I, it's a really amazing work that he did in this document called Defending Pol Politically Vulnerable Organizations Online. And uh, he says uh, the focus is on organizations that are attacked because of the political nature of their work. Politically vulnerable organizations may be the target of governments, criminals, hate groups, hacktivists, and many other threat actors, and they may be targeted for many different reasons. The term politically vulnerable is not intended to define an organization as inherently weak, but rather to highlight that they may be subject to attack for expressing minority politically unpopular opinions. Right? And um, let's move on. Mm -hmm. Another amazing piece of work that you should look at is uh, made by this group called Engine Room, which is another NGO, uh, their international group, and it's called Ties That Bind, introducing our new research on organizational security for civil society. And um, it talks about, it basically they say in 2018, civil society is the almost entirely reliant on technology, and that's true. And it goes through the fact that uh, not only are these groups doing so many changes and so responsible for so many wins, but they're now targeted on a level like never before. And at that same time, they're completely now technology reliant. So it becomes super easy to take them out. Uh, I'm an advisor to the Internet Freedom Festival, which is a meeting that happens in Valencia. We currently have an um, a open call for submissions if anyone's interested, but definitely go to the website and learn more about this group. Uh, there's also a job area there, which isn't jobs for IFF. It's jobs in civil society for people who are technologists and designers, et cetera. Right? Uh, I'm an advisor to a group called the Open Technology Fund, which funds people's work. If you had an idea that's going to help people outside of the United States do good work, it's going to fight surveillance, they will give you a check to do your work, no strings attached. All you have to do is fill out a web form and hope that your submission gets accepted, and it's a rolling submission process, and there's many different places from a red team lab to uh, events under a community that you could apply for, so please do that. Uh, because I live in the United States and I'm a person of color, or more importantly, uh, I would just say a, a black person, uh, you know, technology is something that tends to happen to me and people who look like me. So I work with the National Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers, assisting them because a lot of times you'll get what's called the United States a public defender. It's a free lawyer to advise you in your case. And you might have a very simple case that involves technology, and it's like, look, we know that you're in this place because of your IP address, and it's not actually concrete true, but your lawyer doesn't know that. Right? They don't know about VPNs, they don't know about proxies, they don't know about how that's not actually concrete, or open Wi-Fi and someone else could be using your network, and things like that. And just by advising someone with 20 minutes of your time could be the difference between someone serving time in, li uh, in jail or, or having their freedom. Right? And then I work with a group called Human Rights Foundation, which is a, an or, um, a conference in Oslo, Norway, every year, called the Oslo Freedom Forum. Please look at some of their videos on YouTube. It's really amazing stuff. Um, it's kind of like TED for, for dissidents and human rights defenders who will tell you their stories, and uh, I'm honored to be able to assist them with their digital stuff. Um, so I worked with a group in the United States called Color of Change. Color of Change is a group that um, after Katrina, which was a huge kind of act of God, natural disaster hurricane uh, that affected predominantly African Americans or black folks in America, uh, this organization was founded to make sure nothing like that happens again and that we actually had some um, agency and used our networks to control things so it's not just the government helping us, that we can help ourselves. And uh, please learn more about Color of Change. I was a Color of Change for 10 months and I changed the trajectory of that organization. That's what my talk is about. How to change the trajectory of these like different kinds of groups, whether it's five people who meet in a living room or a group like Color of Change, which has like offices in like five different states and major cities inside the United States, right? They are just the same equal level of vulnerability because of their lack of understanding of the world that we take for granted, okay? Um, I'm also worked with a group called the Movement for Black Lives, which is an umbrella organization of 60 different groups, including Black Lives Matter, which is probably one of the most well-known of the 60. But each one is very different, fighting against uh, police violence and issues that face black folks inside the U.S. Um, and again, like, you know, what happened with us is, you know, there are certain groups that we might say are be heroes in our minds, like, let's say, Anonymous or other hacktivist groups. Um, but 
hacktivists don't always have the, um, the nuanced political uh, socioeconomic uh, thinking to understand like who's a friend and who's a foe. And once you la launch an op against an organization, you can't unlaunch it, right? So, um, you know, for example, Black Lives Matter had a DDoS attack that took down their website for three days. And had it uh, not been for uh, a group in civil society that does tech work, called Equality out of Canada, the site would probably be down to this day because they did not know what to do and how to stop it. And it was like, you know, through just using their project Deflect, which is easy to use and super cheap, uh, the website can't stood back up and stood up to an insane um, DDoS attack, which is not my talk to give. Right? So um, organizational security is different from individual security because an organization cannot install signal. It does not have a phone or a human body. I know that's radical thinking, but it's like, can we just install Signal? No, you don't have a pocket, you're an organization, right? So whether it's four people in a kitchen who are fighting for environmental rights, or whether it's like, you know, a huge organization with keys to an office, there is no pocket with a phone in there, right? Yeah, I know, it's crazy. So um, to safeguard them, I've designed a framework that's always worked for me, and I believe it could work with you, and I'm, that's the, the subject of my talk, okay? Um, this is the framework here, and I'll try to get to each of these points as quickly as I can before I run out of time. But if I don't, this is the most important slide, right? Um, so, yeah, okay. Now I'm just going to try to go through each of these points, which is like physical, psychological safety, uh, security policy, incident response plan checklist, data retention policy, weakest link mitigation strategy, and change offboarding, onboarding, which is the most important one. But then the idea that you actually test the organization by creating a once a year, if they have a tolerance for that twice a year, if they have a tolerance for that four times a year, once a quarter, actual simulation, right? You get a literal shoebox with paper in it, they pull their hand in, and they pull out, okay, oh, well, today's the day we have a DDoS attack, or, oh, today's the day that uh, nobody's phone works, or we found out, whatever, that the number one tool we use for uh, our stuff has been um, compromised, right? So, like, Matt, you know, you have a server that's relying on libssh, and then you find out in an email at 2 in the morning that it's been compromised. How would you come up, what would you do? If you've done it before in a simulation, at least you're a little bit more prepared for when that reality hits. And, you know, make sure that the WC doesn't have a cue to it because it's going to be filled with people running back and forth. Keep the coffee brewing, okay? Okay, so um, physical, psychological stuff. Uh, I don't know. I'll try to go through this quickly because it makes... I know what this stuff is, but maybe you don't. Uh, proof of life is this concept that there's information that is not available on the Internet that is proof that you're alive. And it's really important that everyone in a politically vulnerable organization have this, right? So... If I think that you are kidnapped, or if I think that something's wrong with you, or if I think that you're not around, this is something that someone can't check on Facebook about you to prove that you're actually there and you're actually alive. If there's a reporter that's missing from an investigative research group, I can say, well, you know, if you really have this person, you know, what was their favorite toy when they were five or something like that, right? That's not on the internet. This idea of daily check-ins is a very physical security idea, but it's really important before we do our work because, uh, you know, tactical tech has a body of work um, that's about uh, holistic security. It's actually titled Holistic Security. And it explains that security doesn't exist in a, bath, um, in, a, in a vacuum. Security is part of a living body that is your body. So if you feel that you're stressed out, if you feel that you can't get up in the morning, if you feel that uh, there's bullets flying outside, you're probably going to mess up your... Um, entering your passphrase, right? You're not going to be thinking, I should put this in a secret channel on this app that has an option to do um, regular unencrypted messaging, right? Um, Warm-up campaigns in the event someone goes missing, right? So if I'm like Kasoji or if I'm someone who's, uh, you know, a journalist or an activist that I, we are, there are known threats against, you don't want to launch a Facebook, Twitter, fundraising for the family, research if you know something, campaign, when the person goes missing, that's time you do not have, right? Understand digital location tracking and monitoring. And um, I gave a, a talk on cell location tracking um, at Georgetown Policy, which is more specifically on this. But you can't have people in hiding who are using cell phones. And that's a key important thing. And in fact, most technology that you give them must be cycled out. And if you can't have a courier or someone work with them, they cannot have technology. Um, you know, if you have a, a phone, and it's a safe, clean phone, but you're calling the number one person in your life, that's obviously you. 
So you, you, uh, you have to understand that uh, the people and things and places you need to contact, you have to have a secure way to contact them, or they need to have themselves completely clean new phones and numbers that have been seeded with a couple of calls. They don't just get calls the day after you disappear and go into hiding, right? Um, stay random. That could be that shoebox with paper strips in it. It could be a coin toss. It could be anything. Whether you're deciding to use the bathroom on the first floor or the second floor, flip a coin. Don't create a pattern. Uh, create something that's called a go bag or bug out bag. And that is for you to just leave with. Yeah, your laptop should not be part of that. I'm sorry. Yeah, you know, like it is just a change of clothes, maybe deodorant. I've been behind some of you in the queue. I know, right? It's a joke. You could laugh. Uh, you know, so, um, and practice going to a safe place. If you have an idea of a safe place you would go if there was something wrong, don't make it the first time you're going there when there is something wrong, because you'll realize there's all kinds of complicated things as you try to get there, all right? So now into the more technical stuff, security policy. Uh, for working with a vulnerable organization, politically vulnerable, they have a job to do, and they're usually understaffed, and they don't have time to become computer experts at all. So this is designed to be really, really simple, high-level, basic stuff, because when they're dealing with issues, that's about the tolerance level of what they can handle, right? So you create a policy of what everyone is doing yesterday. So in a politically vulnerable organization, what everyone's doing yesterday to be digitally safe is pretty much nothing, and that's what this policy is. Because when someone like myself shows up, because there was some issue, because uh, with DJS, you know, I travel all over the place, um, it's not because, hey, this could happen. It's because, no, this did happen yesterday, and like there's an adversary in the server. Look, there they are going back, taking some more files, right? So um, what are you doing right now is really important to someone who wants to help, and it's very important for them to understand. And that list usually is uh, we have a, a password to unlock our screensaver because it's not what one person is doing who's like 007, Jane Bond, James Bond. You know, It's what everyone is doing with 95 to 100% compliance. And then that list becomes really, really small. When that list is long, something is wrong or somebody is lying. And then you, that is your security policy. And that's all it is. And you just make sure everyone's doing that thing that you thought everyone is doing. Once you get there, you maybe add one extra thing, like use Signal, all right? Um, but on that, it takes time to get that adoption in. You've got to make sure that it works in that country. There are a lot of places where the app does not work at all. Right? Uh, for various different reasons, uh, whether it's like people have a, a, a cultural like reason where they're focused on outside of using it. Uh, you know, like if you're working with people who are using Telegram, psychologically, they have a concept that Signal's not safe for them. You can't, you can't give it to them, right? And other places, like if you were in Iran, where Google doesn't, services don't exist and there's no Google Play Store, right? You can't use a product that has a Google dependency. So it doesn't work, right? Um, Find out the norms and practices that everyone are following by following them around, which means you have to go to the place. You cannot help a politically vulnerable organization from an air-conditioned room. If there's a Starbucks logo in the trash can, you're in the wrong place, right? So you've got to be where they are, all right? So if they're on the equator, you've got to go to the equator, you know? If they're sitting in a boardroom in the, you know, the Balkans, you've got to be in a boardroom in the Balkans. That's the only way to properly help, because everything works, from the best seat in the world, right? So uh, nothing works when you're actually there with them, right? I was doing work in Africa, and I was like, oh, this is awesome. Just do this, just do that. Oh, wait, these Tor nodes are too far away. Oh, this thing doesn't work. Oh, I thought you were kidding, but you're right. You're running Windows XP on a pirated machine that you share with your family members, and you are uh, one of the best journalists in this area, or you are um, uh, someone who's very politically active in this area, you need to be there to see these things. So before you can talk about, uh, you know, let's lock down your stuff at full disk encryption, right? That's a joke too, but it's okay, it didn't land. Um, what classifications do we have? So I classify all things as traffic lights, red, yellow, green, right? So the files are all classified red, red yellow, green. If a file is okay to go public, it shouldn't go public, but if it's okay to go public, it's green, right? And uh, if a file is highly sensitive, and it ex you shouldn't even be looking at it, and you just wrote it, that's red, right? Now, you make all your devices have the same thing, and it's pretty simple. You don't get a green document on a red uh, device, and you don't get a red document on a green device. You keep everything matched up, right? So. If there's a, you follow the chain of custody of a sensitive document, and every system that it touches needs to have extreme level of lockdown and security on it, 
And uh, there's no way it should ever touch a system that doesn't have that. And that's something that people can actually wrap their minds around, right? And that basic um, codifying and, and categorizing of stuff is where you're going to spend the most of your time. And by most of your time, I mean almost a year, right? Uh, everyone knows you should use a strong password and things like that. You have to literally define these things for people who are super busy. And it needs to be written down on a very simple laminated card that's not electronic, that's in a file cabinet covered in dust. And hopefully they never need to wipe it out, right? Because they've memorized this stuff, right? You give everyone a black crayon and they put an X through the checks of all the stuff they're following because it's the only way a stressed out person is going to be able to do this stuff. You would think that if your life depended on it, you would be able to do all this stuff if I told you these are the three steps to keep you alive. But there are people who are told, hey, if you don't stop eating this way, if you don't stop living this way, you will die. And everyone wants to live, and those people do die, right? Ask a doctor. So if you tell someone there's an invisible threat, and if you don't tap this key this way, it's going to hurt you, good luck. It doesn't work, right? Moving on. So going back to this checklist, on the other side of all the daily operation stuff is an incident response checklist. And all this is is like what to do in the highly likely possibility that this thing happens. And it's like check, check, check. And the last thing's always a smiley face because the anxiety rises when people are like, did I do everything I was supposed to? Did I do enough? And it's like smiley face. I'm done, right? Twitter tweets are flying out, but no one in our organization is writing them. That sucks. Here's this weird page that no one will ever find when they're stressed out on Twitter to report that properly, right? Maybe there's a, I'm, I'm in a place where the government isn't corrupt and isn't working against me, and there's a group that does incident response. There's a group that does emergency response, like a cert team. You know, if you don't have a warmed up relationship with that team, if you don't know what extension to, to put in or what email to write, it's going to slow you down. You can report this. Maybe you're not the only organization that does this work that's being attacked right now, right? Um, and things along those lines. And again, this fits on one sheet of paper with a little black crayon and it's laminated so it's plasticky and you could just wipe it clean when you're done, right? How do you deal with lost and stolen equipment is key. But another thing I should add to this is how do you deal with equipment that nobody knows where it came from, right? So if there's a, hey, hey, everybody on the mailing list, there's a, I, did somebody leave an iPhone in the, it, it's not a bug that's going to get you. It's this obvious stuff, right? Nobody wants to throw out an iPhone. That shit is magic, right? So if you put an iPhone someplace, they're going to keep it in the organization forever in a nice, easy place so you can see it. Is this maybe yours? I'll keep it up front in the meeting room or in the front desk, right? Like, this is real, right? So if you don't have a rule that's like, we're going to put this stuff in a clear Faraday bag and then put that in this iron box and cover it with blankets or something, then it's going to create problems. What do I do if someone's sending email acting like us? And I don't mean that you're the person. I was at an event like this for civil society, and there was like a major organization that everybody knows, and the executive director wrote an email, and it was like, hey, there's some changes to our organization with a link on it, and you would click on it. As, you know, like nobody in here would not click on this thing. But because everyone was in this meeting room, everyone got the notification, like, boop, 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 and it was just lit up. So everyone got the email at the same time. That's the only reason why the spear phishing attack didn't work. It was like, well, that's weird. Are you seeing this? Like, why are we all getting this? To see? But if, you, if they were in their offices, it would have worked, right? And you don't always get so lucky. But that person didn't write a, listen, I didn't just write this email that you may all have been receiving. This is what to do. So there's a certain um, duty of care, which I'll get into later, certain responsibility that you, as someone who gets faked a lot or spoofed a lot, you need to do that, even though it's not your org, right? And again, there's some basic stuff on this. I'm just going to move on. But business continuity plan is a lot of organizations, you, the stuff that we would tell them to do just will not stick. And there's no way in hell that they're going to do it because their workflow is tight enough. They're barely meeting their deadlines. Even a five-minute change will cause them to like, completely destroy the organization. And your helping will actually destroy the organization. So don't do that, right? But what you can maybe do is say, here is a plan of a bunker, right? You run into this bunker if there's a serious like nuclear attack type of situation, right? And it's like, I know you don't have time to use proton mail, or I know you don't have time to do all these different things. But in the case of like complete horrible stuff, this is what you do. You communicate this way. Instead of everyone in the org, it's only four people talking. Everyone goes home, right? Um, you keep your money in a completely different place in case your account gets frozen and all this basic stuff like that. And then, you know, you can introduce them to Bitcoin. So, you know, Ankit will, and uh, Aaron will see their 
see their charges on the, on the blockchain, right? Okay, moving on. I said Bitcoin. I just got to say blockchain. Done. Okay. So, <laughs> nice. I'm getting that money now. I am from New York. So, uh, have a data retention policy. And this is really basic. You know, like in New York, one thing that they always say is, you know, when you go into your apartment and you buy all that stuff from Ikea or whatever, you come back the next day and your apartment's emptied out and there's nothing left but a little thank you note, that sucks, right? So, like, but people can only steal what's there. And that's the same thing that it works with people's data. A lot of these organizations have an identity management problem when it comes to their digital security, where they have shares that they've written. Like, I've shared this document in 2004 with sensitive information, and it's still shared to this day. I guarantee you no one looks at this document. It does not need to be accessible. We all know that easily accessible stuff could just be taken overnight. So what you need to do is get them to a place where they're not saying, like, should I keep this? They're kind of like doing that, like, you know, Marie Kendo method, like, does this spark joy? Like, you know? So they're just like, yo, do I absolutely, like, do, what is a reason why I would not throw this shit out? Excuse the French, right? That's not really French. Um, so you're going to be like, you know, this document from yesterday's board meeting, why is it highly accessible? Who wants to say why and sign this like, I am saying this is that we need this. We're all signing on this. I said we needed this. I guarantee you nobody wants to be written on down and say, I'm accountable for this document living, and everything is going to end up getting archived and encrypted. Right? Have a definition for what archiving is. Have a definition for what deleting is. Yes, you know, I'm really happy that I got to speak after the people who do physical destruction. That was like a really happy accident, because at the end of the day, a lot of people don't realize that USBs and hard drives and all this stuff contain that data. And it's how these organizations get attacked. Um, there was a great talk at RSA, um, I think 2017, that uh, Google made about email. And they say that nonprofits and, not, and, and NGOs are like the number one attacked part of Gmail, right? Uh, their, their Google suites are getting attacked constantly. And there's no need for them having all this email in there. If you use Google Suite, Google has a lot of things that you could use. They have a product called Vault, which is used for e-discovery, but it can help you quickly see like all your emails over time, all this other stuff. If you use G Suite, the G Suite admin can see the subject line of every single email the organization writes. Which is super creepy, but it's a true thing, right? And they can use that to like lock down and put things away very easily. So you should do that stuff. And again, um, have some kind of inventory for your file system. Everyone knows when you buy a computer, you make a folder structure that's like 2018, and then you have another folder underneath it, and it's like receipts. And then by the end of the year, receipts roll over your desktop, right? So like that's reality for these organizations too, and there's no changing that. In fact, it's 100 times worse. But what you need to do is just say, look, we're going to actually format all our computers on January 30th, and they're all going to be wiped clean. And then you let everybody know that, and people will be moving only the most important stuff to where they need to archive um, and encrypt that stuff, right? And yeah, it's a painful process, but you'll realize um, there's an idea with physical security where you put the shredder twice as, uh, as, as close to you as possible, and you put the garbage can as far away from everyone as possible, and everyone shreds everything, right? And this is the same thing, right? Because people are lazy. So uh, I have a weakest link mitigation strategy. We all know there's a weakest link, right? Like, we have to get out of this room, there's only one door. And that door has a handle. Here at Hack LU, you got to, like, turn it, right? Which means if one of you doesn't wash your hands, none of us are washing our hands, right? <laughs> yeah, think about that one, right? So, and I know who you are. I see you. Wash them, please, okay? So the same thing works with an organization. You have to teach them that their level of security is equal to the lowest level of security maintained by any one person. That could be an intern, because a lot of these organizations are fueled by hopes and dreams and rainbows, and that equals free volunteer work. Everyone needs to follow these policies. There cannot be a security person who worries about this all the time. Security needs to live inside of everyone's minds, just like how the, like, you know, there's things like, you know, uh, we have some basic norms here. You don't just say, uh, get out of here, you're fired, or I don't like your pants. Like, there's rules about how this organization works, right? So just as how there's no one who's there who just leads that, um, there's no one who should be the security officer. Security needs to live in the DNA of the org, if that makes any sense. But you do want to have this idea of, like, a fire warden. At 5.45 or something like that in the morning, there was an alarm that went off. It was not my uh, cell phone alarm on my, on my iPhone, right? It was a fire alarm here in this building, and it woke everybody up. And, right? So if, you're, if it didn't wake you up, you might have burnt to death, and that would have been a tragedy, okay? So, but it woke me up, and that fire warden wakes up the organization. That fire warden says, listen, 
I'm the point of contact. How do you pick the fire warden? You find the person who obviously knows the least, and you empower them. You're in charge of getting everyone on signal. Why me? I don't know. This is reasons, right? And that, that person will just love it. They'll become drunk with power. They will go around to everyone. Are you on signal? Are you on signal? Right? And in actuality, all you wanted was them to go on signal. Right? But now you have this person who's the signal person. They're like, oh, I got it. Right? And that is how you work in these orgs. And that's what you need. And you don't make the person who's in charge of other things that same person. You got to spread the love. Because trust me, there's many weak links. Right? Okay. Boom, boom. Okay. So changing onboarding and offboarding. In these organizations, they're underpaid and overworked, which is a recipe for high turnover. That is your best friend. You change onboarding. This people who work at this org will not be working there in, I don't know, give them three years maybe, right? At three years, two days, if I see someone still works there, it's like the walking dead. Like they're just about to quit, right? So you change onboarding because the day someone walks in the door, they want to do a great job. So you change all the job descriptions that say must have a really good understanding of digital safety hygiene or something like that. Nobody knows what that is. And they're like, oh, I studied for this interview. What is that? And then you just, at the interview, you just make it, you, you probably have this job, but we realize you don't have the last thing. And you stress them with that. Then they get the job and they start and you train them on what that is in this organization. I guarantee you they will adopt it immediately, but they will realize that they're the only one doing this. Thank you. Right? Over time, through aging everyone out, only these people are running the organization. So even if you're a complete failure, you will succeed in the long run with this strategy. With offboarding, you want to ask people, like, hey, do you happen to have any files that still belong to us? Or is there like a hard drive under a desk somewhere that you took because you need to work on a weekend or like things like that? And there, there always is. There's always some like, we needed to get some stuff to the travel company, so we broke protocol. When someone's on their way out, they're going to give you all these answers. They should sign off on it. I, yes, I said I had this thing, and I will bring it back in two days. Because once they get out of that door on their last day with their cardboard box, right, they're not coming back, and you can't find them. Right? Okay, so uh, I'm working with this illustrator named Jason Lee to take these concepts that I've been working on for years with a lot of different organizations in a lot of little, little hostile environments around the world, and it makes them these really cute, really emoji-covered, simple things. So you don't even need to make the one sheet. You just print my one sheet, right? Because I want, like, I don't want to do that stuff. There's all the other stuff I want to do. Like, you know, directly affected people, they don't want to be, like, freedom fighters and stuff. They just want to hang out and play video games. I got a Nintendo Switch I never get to play. You know, like, if the world changes and everyone starts adopting these things, I'll have a lot more free time. And this is an example of what Jason's stuff looks like. Uh, he wrote and illustrated this comic book called Teacher's Pet, and he did a lot of work uh, with this organization called Citizen Lab, um, which is out of the uh, Monk School of Foreign Affairs in uh, Canada. Boom. Okay, so listen, this is how you reach me. I'm on Twitter. I only have one or two followers. I'm still an egg. I want you to please follow me, please. My, my ego needs the follow, right? Um, on Medium, there's a post. It's called How to Re Reach Matt Mitchell Securely. I'm Matt Mitchell. There's verification right here, okay? Um, I look a lot neater and a lot cleaner in that picture, but, you know, that's how it is. People of color, you know what it is, you know? So... Um, in there, it's how to reach me in all the different methods that anyone could reach me, from how to reach me on, um, uh, on, on my favorite secure comms app, which is Wire right now, or how to send me a PGP email. And I try to document it step by step for folks, you know? So you got to be where people are. Ricochet, I hear you, I see you, right? So, um, and that's that. Okay, I don't have any time, but uh, do I have time for questions? Okay, dope. All right, everybody, uh, thank you for being here. Thank you so much, honestly, for listening to this. It's not the typical Hack LU talk. Please take care of each other, okay? Thank you. Questions? Thank you so much for your talk. You're making the world a better place. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Um, you can too. <laughs> yes, that was my question. So you said earlier, if I have only five minutes, like yes. every two months, what do I do? Yeah, so I had a much, I was remixing these slides to this minute because there was no way I could fit it in this time, which is, I apologize for those of you who, uh, uh, English is not like your first language and I'm talking like a New Yorker. I apologize. <laughs> um, so there's a group called Security Without Borders 
started by this hacker known, uh, formerly known as Nex, N-E-X, whose name is Claudio. And Security Without Borders has a mailing list, and they have a website, and they're designed for you to do this. But what it basically boils down to, I would tell you, is uh, you do not start by going to the front lines. Uh, that, that, that is not good for, you know, my therapist is like, whew, <laughs> slow down, right? So um, don't start there, trust me. You want to start, like, in your flat. Maybe there's other flats around you. So I remember my friend Annabelle had asked me this question too. You put a flyer up in the, on everyone's door. Uh, I'm going to be talking about how to keep your bank account from getting hacked, which is obviously not what you're talking about, but that's what people understand this as, right? Meet me outside in the park. I guarantee you no one will arrive. Do not take it personally, right? So you just continue to do it. And if you, the first three months, you'll be by yourself with some birds you're feeding. But on the fourth month, one person will show up. And they'll be like, how do I do it? And you teach them about two-factor and strengthening their password. But then on the fifth month, more people show up. And then someone says, hey, by the way, um, I have a cousin who lives in Syria who might need something like this. Boom. And that's how it happens through human relations. Everyone in this room knows someone who self-identifies as an activist. It might be someone who's just writing emails to the prime minister that get deleted immediately from the inbox, right? But um, it, it, that is who that person is. And through that random spear you're going to find through trust, right, which is the only currency in this game, you're going to find that person, right? So, um, and through those people, like, I get contacted every day through these people. And it's horrible, though, because people just literally call me on unencrypted lines and stuff, but I just usher them off as quick as possible. But through that trust, like, you'll get people reaching out to you all the time. Like, I work with a lot of people who are involved in the U.S. Uh, Me Too movement just randomly because I helped one person and, you know, through your ability to keep, to keep your mouth shut as well. If you're like, oh, man, yesterday I was working with these people from this part of the world, like, you're never going to get work again. It's going to get back to them, all right? So I hope that's a good answer. Yeah. Next. <laughs> More questions? Where I got my hat, maybe? No? Yeah. No questions? <laughs> no okay, questions cool. about that. Um, um, I mentioned uh, tactical tech. Uh, for, for those of you that are in Luxembourg, at uh, the student fair in Luxembourg next month, we will be uh, having the Glass Room, which is a project by tactical tech. So if you're here, um, come along and see that. Their work is great. We've already done it here in Luxembourg for schools and things. Um, so you'll be it's a couple of weeks. People in Luxembourg know where that is. But. You know what it is, Lux. It, go see the Glass Room experience. It's amazing. It's like uh, Black Mirror, but real. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, a lot of people, they're like, yo, I was just watching that Netflix. It was crazy. And I'm like, you know, that's based on a real thing, right? So that is hard research, but for the public. And it's kind of where Tactical Tech does. It's less a question, just a comment on that question which was there before. Um, thanks for the nice idea of sitting in the park, but to go into more concrete uh, paths, uh, crypto party movement exists all over the world. Um, that's something where you can just go and spend some time with, for, for example, being a like, second level expert for those crypto party guys. Like if you don't want to spend five hours, but five minutes, this might be an option. And then all the organizations you would find all around you, starting at hackerspaces and ending at all these NGOs you were saying. Thank you. Thank you, Swal. Thank you so much. Yeah, CryptoParty.in. Uh, it's a website where you can find crypto parties. They were designed by Asher Wolf, who's a woman for Australia, made the first crypto party ever. Uh, crypto means cryptography, not cryptocurrency. Sorry, New York bros. Um, and Luxembourg bros. Yeah, and Luxembourg bros. Yeah. So, um, yeah, that's, crypto parties are amazing. In Berlin alone, there's multiple. Uh, shout out to Malta and um, other folks who do them. Uh, more questions, comments? I know you all want to go for lunch. Yes. But no, we're not going for nope, lunch yet. Sorry, you And get starving. close on those tables for lunch, Empathize please. with the hungry, yeah. Hi, hey, uh, where did you get your hat? Yo, <laughs> let me tell you. I live in Harlem, and uh, I just walk down the street, and people have insane, ridiculous style. But in here, it's like, it's just too much. So I just got the worst thing I could find. But uh, now I see it on Amazon for like $7 from China, because that's the world we're in. But I was first. So you, you got it here. Okay. Thank you, bro. I needed that, yo. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, I think you, they can eat now, right? Yeah, you can eat now, but yeah. sit close to people. Yeah. Please. Yeah. So, yeah. Hackers, help people, please. Okay. <laughs>